after his time with the Black Legion and rescuing his, his future wife from brigands and all of this, he has an incredible military career, a military career that will be unparalleled for a person of color in a white or Western army until the end of the 20th century. He will rise within four years from corporal to the equivalent of four-star general with command of over 50,000 troops, which in those days was an enormous army. But when he gets command of the army, which is the army of the Alps, it's the most um, ill-equipped of the French armies. And at this time, the French Revolution has turned to you know, the kind of bloody chaos that we think of. The reason the French Revolution turned to such bloodshed in Paris and so many people got their heads cut off was because the French government, the French revolutionary government, found itself part, immediately part, of a world war. It found itself at war with every other country in Europe. And the people that it most needed and most distrusted were its officer corps. Every country in Europe attacked uh, the French revolutionaries because they did not want a repeat of what had happened in America a decade earlier to happen in the heart of Europe. They did not want a democratic republic to take root in the heart of royal Europe. And so the great heroes and the great sort of uh, uh, men of the French Revolution, in fact, were not the politicians talking in Paris, but really the, the, a certain number of generals in the field. So this is the height of the committee of the period of the Committee of Public Safety and of when Robespierre is you know moving into the high terror where if uh, you cross the government or even if you don't cross the government if you're a person of influence it's very likely that you'll lose your head. In the midst of this General Dumas gets the most poorly equipped and the most ridiculously challenged army of all because he's told to take the Alps for France. He is sent up there with, in command of 53,000 revolutionary troops who are incredibly poorly equipped. They, they don't have boots, and it's uh, the campaign, he, he joins the campaign in January. Now the Alps at the time were not held by France, they were held by the people who knew much more how to hold them, which were the uh, Austrians and, and their allies, who are the best Alpine fighters in the world, and they've held these peaks for a couple of hundred years. Well, General Dumas, very typically of, of, of how he operates, he goes and just teaches his uh, soldiers to trap the local animals, to make themselves boots and coats, and then he finds a way to put spikes on these boots, because where the Austrians are, they have all the high positions. He has to get up 2,000 feet. He realizes there's one place you can attack the Austrians from, and it's a little like the guns of Navarone. He is going to go up this 2,000 foot, you know, almost sheer cliff. And he has to do it at night. And he has to get up there before dawn so that they can take the enemy by surprise. Anyway, he manages to do all these incredible things. He takes the Alps for France. He becomes a four-star general. Then he joins the campaign to liberate Italy. Uh, then he will go to uh, Egypt as part of the French expedition to Egypt. He's actually the cavalry commander of the French forces in Egypt, all of these things. Um, so it's fairly re remarkable uh, right away that we have not heard of him because just as a military figure, it's an incredible story. I would say it's one of the most incredible underdog stories of all time when you think about where he's come from and where he gets to within, you know, before he's 30, really, before all this happens. Everything I've said happens to him when he's in his late 20s. But it is also the, um, I mean, in some ways, one of the most incredible African-American success stories of all time, aside from just an underdog story. And that is very much not only the, the fact of General Dumas, but the fact of a unique forgotten moment in uh, European history and in Western history that I only discovered because of this book. And this is this sort of decade when the French Revolution would not only emancipate uh, its 
slaves, and I to, for the French to, em to emancipate their slave empire, you've got to imagine that in the 18th century, the French slave empire was the largest, most lucrative slave empire the, the world had ever seen, and certainly the largest one in the West. Yet, during the French Revolution, the revolutionaries unilaterally dismantle it. And they not only do that, but they go much farther towards, they integrate their army, which is how General Alex Dumas can rise the way he does and become a four-star general. But they also integrate their political system. The head of the French Senate is actually black, which is not you know, one of these sort of head scratchers that, that I found doing this. They even begin to integrate their school system. So they do things in the 1790s that won't be seen again uh, for more than a century and a half. This whole research brought me to discover that there was actually a fascinating, amazing precedent for this that had happened over the 50 years before the French Revolution, which was that there had been a civil rights movement in France that really is the first civil rights movement in the world, and that is really 200, more than 200 years before what we call the civil rights movement. This fascinating thing that was led by a generation of crusading lawyers. So in that way, it was very similar to the civil rights movement in the United States, um, um, only without Martin Luther King figure. Instead, just imagine the sort of from Brown versus Board of Education on, imagine the series of court cases and imagine that something similar existed in the, um, ancien, under the Ancien Regime in France from the 1690s up until the 1790s for this hundred years. The French high courts, the French Parlement, increasingly um, they would hear cases brought to them by black people who found themselves in France the property of masters who had brought them to France, and they would get a lawyer, or a lawyer would find them, and say, let's bring a court, let's bring a court case to one of these parliaments, or bring a court case to the High Court of Paris, based on an ancient body of law that gets very weird, that goes back to Charlemagne, um, according to these lawyers, that said you could, that France, the word France and the, the Franks uh, the tribe that started France, that it means freedom and that there cannot be, that it is fundamentally contradictory to uh, have slaves within France. Essentially, there was this civil rights movement that was run by um, lawyers who were all aristocrats who, during the course of the early decades of the 18th century, became more and more convinced that slavery and, in fact, any kind of unequal rights based on race um, were inimical to ancient French laws. And they created the, uh, a body of law that had not existed there before. Oddly, some of them were women. I found this woman aristocrat who spent her entire life creating a body of law based on, it was called the French Freedom Principle, showing that this freedom principle had roots in the Middle Ages and uh, that it should really super, that, that, that it should supersede the Atlantic slave trade and it should supersede any money the, that Versailles or the court was making off of slaves and sugar because it was a more fundamental law. And anyway, they brought cases and there are a lot of spectacular, crazy cases that were brought. And the amazing thing was that almost all the cases were won by the um, blacks and their, um, and their lawyers. <laughs>